My name is Matthew Dawn. My candidate number is 9041. I play Edgar, and these are extracts from Shakespeare's King Lear. My name is Jamie Harvey. I play Edmund. My candidate number is 9071, and it's a naturalistic performance. My name is Connor Mokes. My candidate number is 9115, and I'm playing Gloucester. Thy nature art my goddess, to thy law my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom, and permit the curiosities of nations to deprive me? For that I am twelve or fourteen moonshines like of a brother. Why, bastard? Wherefore base? Well, my dimensions are as well complex, my mind is generous and my shape is true. As honest madam's issue, why brand they us with base? With baseness, bastardy, base, base! Who, in the lusty stealth of nature, take more composition of fierce quality than doth within a dull, stale, tired bed, go to the creating a whole tribe of fobs, got tween asleep and wake? Well, my legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to the legitimate. Fine word, legitimate. Well, my legitimate, if this letter speed and my invention thrive, Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow, I prosper. Now, gods, stand up for bastards. Kent, banish thus. And France in collar parted. The king, gone tonight, subscribed his power, confined to exhibition. All this done upon the gap. Edmund, how now? What news? So please, your lordship, none. Why so earnestly seek me to put up that letter? I know no news, my lord. What papers were you reading? Nothing, my lord. Oh. What needed then that terrible dispatch of it into your pocket? The quality of nothing hath not such need to hide itself. Come, let's see. If it be nothing, I shall not need spectacles. I beseech you, sir. Pardon me, but it is a letter from my brother that I have not yet all over read. And for so much I have perused, I find it not fit of your overlooking. Give me the letter, sir. I shall offend either to detail or to give it. The content, as in part them I understand, are to blame. Let's see, let's see. I hope from my brother's justification. He wrote this but as an essay or taste of my virtue. This policy and reverence of age makes the world bitter to the best of our times. Keeps our fortunes from us till our oldness cannot relish them. I begin to find an idle and fond bondage in the oppression of age tyranny. Who sways not as it hath power, but as it is suffered. Come to me that of this I may speak more. Should our father sleep till I waked him, you should enjoy half his revenue and live the beloved of your brother, Edgar. <clears throat> Conspiracy. Should he sleep till I waked him, you should enjoy half his revenue. My son, Edgar, had he a hand to write this, a heart and brain to breed it in? It was not brought to me, my lord. There's the cunning of it. It was thrown in at the casement of my closet. You know the courage to be your brother's. If the matter were good, my lord, I'd have swear it were his. But in respect of that, I would fain think it were not. It is his. It is his hand, my lord. But I hope his heart is not in the contents. Hath he never heard to Paul sound in this business? Never, my lord. But I have heard him off to maintain it to be fit. That sons at perfect age, and fathers declining. That the father should be as ward to the son. And that sons manage his revenue. Oh, villain. Villain! His very opinion in the letter, a born villain, a natural, detested, brutish villain. Worse than brutish. Go, sir, seek him. I'll apprehend him, abominable villain. Where is he? Nor is not sure, sir. But if it shall please you to suspend your indignation against my brother, till I can derive from him better testimony of his intent. Thank you, sir. If your honour judge it meet, I shall place you where you shall hear us confer of this. And by an auricular assurance, have your satisfaction. That without any further delay than this very evening, he cannot be such a monster. Nor is not sure. To his father, who so tenderly and entirely loves him, heaven and earth, Edmund, wind him to me. I pray you, frame the business as your own wisdom. I would unstate myself to be in a due resolution. I will seek him, sir. Presently convey the business, as I shall find means to acquaint you with that. These eclipses in the sun and moon portend no good to us. We've seen the best of our times. Hollowness, treachery, machinations, and all ruinous disorders follow us disquietly to our graves. 
Find out this villain, Edmund, and you'll lose thee nothing. But do it carefully. And the noble and true-hearted Kent hath banished his offence, honesty, distraught. This is excellent foppery of the world, that when we are sick in fortune, often the surfeit of our own behaviour, we make guilty of our disasters, the sun, the moon, the stars. My father compounded with my mother under the dragon's tail, and my nativity on the Ursa Major. So that it follows, I am rough and lecherous. I should have been that I am. Had the maidenly star in the firmament twinkled on my bastardising Edgar. And Patty comes. Like the catastrophe of the old comedy, my cue is villainous melancholy, with a sigh, like Tom O'Bedlam. Oh, these eclipses do pretend these divisions, fasoli me. Ha oh, now, Brother Edmund, what serious contemplation you in? I am thinking, Brother, of a prediction I read this other day. What shall follow these eclipses? Do you busy yourself about that? How long have you been sectary astronomical? Come, come. When saw you my father last? Why the night gone by? Speak you with him. Aye, two hours together. Parted you in good terms. Found you no displeasure by words of my countenance. None at all. Bethink yourself, wherein you may have offended him, and at my entreaty forbear his presence till some little time hath qualified the heat of his displeasure, which at this instant so rageth in him. And with the mischief of your person, it would scarcely allay. Some villain hath done me wrong. That's my fear. I pray you, have a countenance forbearance till the speed of his rage goes slower. And as I say, retire with me to my lodging, from whence I will fitly bring you to hear my lord speak of this. Here's my key. If you do stir abroad, go armed. Armed, brother! Brother, I advise you to the best, go armed! Shall I hear from you, I know? I do serve you in this business. I see the business. Let me, if not by birth, have lands by wit, and with all me's me, that I can fashion fit. Brother! A word, brother! Descend, brother, I say! My father watches. Oh, sir, fly this place. Intelligence is given where you are hid. You have now the good advantage of the night. Have you not spoken against the Duke of Albany? He's coming hither, now in the night, in the haste, and Regan with him. Have you nothing said upon his part against the Duke of Cornwall? Advise yourself. I am sure I'm not a word. I hear my father coming. In cunning I must draw my sword upon you. Draw! Seem to defend yourself. Now quit you well. Yield! Come before my father. Light who here! So farewell. Torches! Torches! Some will draw me not because of him. Of more fierce endeavour. I've seen drunkards do more than this in sport. Father, father! Stop, stop, no help! Now, Edmund, where is the villain? He stood he, in the dark, his sharp sword out, mumbling wicked charms, conjuring the moon to stand the auspicious mistress. But where is he, Edmund? Look, sir, I please! Edmund, where is the villain? Fled this way, when by no means he... Well, then we shall pursue him home! By no means what? Pursue me to the murder of your lordship! Let him fly, Pa! Not in this land shall he remain uncaught, and bound dispatch! The Duke, my master, my worthy arch and patron, comes tonight. By his authority, I'll proclaim it that he which finds him deserves our thanks, bringing the murderous cow to the stake. He that conceals him, death! Old ports are bar, the villain shall not escape. The Duke must grant me that. Besides, his picture are so far and near that the kingdom may have due note of him. And of my lands. Loyal and natural boy, I'll work the means to make thee capable. I heard myself proclaim by the happy hollow of the tree. Es escape the home. No port is free, no place. That card and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. Whilst I may escape, 
I will preserve myself and damn be thought to take the basest and most poorest shape that ever pain me in the contempt of man. Brought near to beast, my face I'll grime with filth. Blanket my loins, health, all my hair in knots, and with presented nakedness of face, the winds and the persecutions of the sky. The country gives me proof and precedent of petrol beggars who, with their roaring voices, strike in their numb and mortified bare arms, pins, wooden pricks, nails, sprigs of rosemary, and with this horrible object from low farms, poor pouting villages, sheep coats and mills, sometime with lunatic bands, sometime with prayers, enforce their charity. Poor Tilly God, poor Tom, has something yet. Edgar, I nothing am. Sirrah, naked fellow. Poor Tom's a cold. I cannot talk it further. Come hither, fellow. Bless thy sweet eyes. They bleed. Dost thou know the way to Dover? There's Thailand Gate. Horse way and foot path. Poor Tom has been scared out of his good wit. Bless thee, good man's son, from the foul fiend. Five fiends have been in poor Tom at once. <coughs> from lust, there's a bidicate. Habitidence, Prince of Dumpness, Mahu of Stealing, Modu of Murder, Flipper to Jipper of Mopping and Mowing, whose things possess as chambermaids and waiting women. So bless thee, Master! Take this purse, thou whom the heavens plagues, have humbled to all strokes, that I am wretched, makes thee the happier. And heavens deal so still, let the surplus and lost diet of man that slaves your ordinance that cannot see, because it does not feel. Feel your power quickly, so distribution should undo excess, and each man have enough. Dost thou know Dover? Aye, master! There is a cliff, whose high and bending head looks fearfully from the confined deeps. Bring me but to the very brim of it, and I'll repair the misery thou dost bear with something rich about myself. From that place, I'll need no leading. Give me thy arm. Poor Tom shall lead thee! When come we to the top of that same hill? We do walk upon it now. Look how we labour. Methinks the ground is even. Horrible state. Hark, do you hear the sea? No, truly. Why then, by your other sense of growth imperfect, by your eyes anguish? So may it be indeed. Methinks. Thou speakest in better phrase and matter than thou didst. You are much deceived. In nothing am I changed except for my garments. Thou art better spoken. Come on, sir. Here's the place. Stand still. How fearful and dizzy tis to cast one's eyes so low. Set me where you stand. Give me thy hand. You are now within the foot of the extreme verge. For all beneath the moon I would not leap upright. Let go of my hand. Here, friends, another purse, in it a jewel well worth a man's taking. Fairies and gods prosper it with thee. Now go thou, farther off, bid me farewell, and let me hear thee going. Fare you well, good sir. With all my heart. Why I do trifle thus, with his despair, is done to cure it. Oh, you mighty gods! If Edgar lives, oh, bless him! Now, fellow! Fare thee well!